You might be experiencing sensory changes after your stroke if you have numbness and tingling on your affected side, hypersensitivity to touch or pressure, difficulty being able to tell the difference between hot and cold, or if you get overstimulated by bright lights, loud noises, smells and tastes, or even being in certain social situations. In today's video, I'll cover the most common types of sensory changes after stroke, why they happen, if they'll go away, and treatments that you can try at home based on evidence. Make sure you stay until the end so you can learn some simple tips and exercises that you can incorporate into your home rehab routine. Before we get into it, make sure you support the channel by liking this video, subscribing, becoming a channel member, or leaving us a super thanks by clicking in the YouTube bar below. Types of sensory changes. The first is tactile or cutaneous, and this has to do with the skin. This is probably the most common and it shows up in a variety of different ways. It might be some type of altered sensation where you feel sort of that pins and needles feeling or tingling. You may have numbness where you can't feel touch or pressure at all, or it is diminished. And on the other end of the spectrum is hypersensitivity where you're overly sensitive to input on your skin. You might also have trouble telling the difference in temperature between hot and cold. And lastly is something called stereognosis. And this is your ability to tell what something is in your hand or by touch without actually seeing it. So an example is putting your hand in your pocket and being able to tell whether you're holding onto a coin or say a paperclip. In addition to cutaneous sensory changes, there are also visual sensory changes. I am gonna cover photosensitivity or being hypersensitive to light after your stroke. There can also be auditory sensory changes, which has to do with your hearing. The most common change is being hypersensitive to sounds, whether it's soft sounds like somebody chewing or background music, or being overstimulated by loud noises, say walking around in a mall with lots of people talking, bangs, and you know different things happening in that environment. Sense of smell can also be impacted, and I have heard from many survivors who are on very different spectrums of this. Some people experience a diminished sense of smell, so difficulty smelling things that also impact your ability to taste things, as well as a hypersensitivity to smell where any type of unpleasant odor or even just an overpowering odor can cause somebody to become nauseous. Of course, speaking of taste, that can also be impacted as well. And just like with smell, you may be hypersensitive or have a diminished sense of taste. And lastly, there are some whole system issues that can crop up as well. One is proprioception, which is your ability to be able to tell where your body is in space. This can become impacted and make moving and balance very difficult. And the last is being overstimulated in social situations. This not only has to do with some of those other sensory issues I've already mentioned, like noises and bright light, but also has to do with that kind of cognitive mental load of keeping up with conversation in addition to those other sensory issues. Why it happens. So what is happening in the brain and the body that causes these sensory changes after a stroke? Well, just like with motor or movement problems after a stroke, this has to do with a breakdown in communication between the brain and the body. It's essentially an interruption in the brain's ability to detect and interpret sensory signals. For example, let's think about talking on the phone with a friend. Let's say they're driving through a dead zone and so you're only getting pieces of that conversation as their voice goes in and out. This is sort of how the brain is trying to interpret signals, but it's not getting the full picture. Now, the brain as a whole works to interpret sensory information, but there are a few areas of the brain that have a more specific role when it comes to directing sensory input and interpreting it. For example, if a stroke occurs in the thalamus, you're more than likely going to experience sensory changes because this is what's called the sensory relay station of our brain. All incoming sensory information from the body, except for smell, has to pass through this little egg-shaped part of our brain before it is sent out to the outer areas of our brain, the cortex, for more processing. And if the parietal lobe is affected, sensory changes are likely to happen. That's because this area is partially responsible for processing and regulating sensations of pain and touch. Will sensory changes go away? The answer, yet again, is it depends. Every stroke is different and every stroke survivor is different. 
I've heard from some survivors whose sensory changes went away in the matter of a couple months, while for others, they're still dealing with them years later. I think the most common experience that I've heard is that sensory changes do get better over time, but they don't necessarily completely go away. But I will say that actively working on them and implementing certain strategies can help to reduce them or at least improve your quality of life. How can you treat sensory changes? Of course, always talk with your doctor or therapist before starting any new therapy or exercise routine. But I'm gonna be breaking this section down into two different areas, modification and remediation. Modification interventions refer to those that help improve your quality of life. They're not necessarily going to fix the problem, but it's sort of a workaround to adapt and modify either your environment or yourself using different types of equipment or strategies to help improve your quality of life. Remediation is working on the underlying issue to make it better. And a quick note, I am linking all of the articles that I used for this video down in the description below. Let's start by talking about modifications. Now this type of intervention is most often used with sensory overload issues or sensory overstimulation. And the first thing that's really important with this type of intervention is to understand your triggers. So know what is going on with you that requires the need for a modification. So for example, I am a chronic sufferer of migraines. I have been since I was a kid. So this makes me hypersensitive to light and to sound. For me, using noise-canceling earbuds, or you could even opt for noise-canceling over-the-ear headphones, has been a game changer. If you also have photosensitivity or that hypersensitivity to light, make sure that you get a good pair of sunglasses when you're going outside, and don't be afraid to wear them indoors if you're in a very fluorescent, brightly lit store. If you deal with sensory overload from social situations, I would recommend looking at what types of situations cause that response. Is it when you're going out into large crowds? If so, would wearing noise-canceling headphones help you? Would wearing sunglasses, especially if you're outside at a concert, help you? Would making sure that you stay on the edges of that large crowd be helpful to know that you can get out of there if you need to? Or do you have more overwhelm, say, going out to a restaurant or maybe even just going over to a friend's house and spending a full day over there. If so, you can think about things like limiting your time out or with others. So instead of say staying for five hours, could you just stay for an hour and a half or two hours? And the last modification I wanna talk about is something to do if you have trouble telling the difference between hot and cold. This may seem really common sense, but I'm gonna mention it anyway. Because this can present a safety issue, especially if you can't tell hot, you have the potential to burn yourself if you use your affected side to say test water when you're taking a shower. I highly recommend using your unaffected side to test say temperature of water before getting into the shower or in other situations like that. All right, now let's switch gears and talk about our remediation group. I do wanna note before I jump in that in all of the evidence that I have reviewed, including multiple clinical guidelines from different national stroke foundations, there is just not really support in the evidence for most of these interventions. Um, most of these clinical guidelines don't include any concrete recommendations for these sensory interventions. As an evidence-based clinician though, I have two thoughts here. The first is that there are some remediation interventions that have promising results, even if there's not enough high quality studies to make that a formal recommendation. And the second is, if an intervention is found in the literature to have conflicting evidence or not enough evidence, but it's also not shown to cause harm, it's worth a try as long as you get approval from your doctor. The first is sensory re-education. And there are a few things that fall under this umbrella term of sensory re-education. One is sensory discrimination. 
And this is where you're trying to re-educate the affected area to tell the difference between different types of sensation. So if you have trouble detecting light touch, pressure, sharp or dull sensations, then sensory discrimination exercises might work well for you. These are going to work best with somebody else because what you're going to do is, let's say that um, your arm is the affected area, you might have somebody else applying light touch with their fingertip. Maybe then they'll go in with a little bit more pressure as they apply it to your arm. You would start by maybe keeping your eyes open and saying, yes, I feel that. I'm looking at it, I'm seeing it, and I'm also feeling it. Or maybe you don't feel it and you'll express that. You could work your way up to having them do those same types of things, but then with your eyes closed. This is a way to make it a little bit more challenging, um, especially if you're starting to regain some of that sensation with your eyes open. Having your eyes closed and having someone touch you and you can say, oh yes, I feel it there, 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 there. You can even describe where on your arm or affected area that you might be feeling that sensation. The next category under this sensory re-education umbrella is textural exposure. If you have difficulty telling the difference between different types of textures, you're going to use different types of textures to help re-educate your brain and retrain your sensory system. So this might include grabbing, say, a cotton ball for a very soft texture, rubbing it on the affected area, seeing if you can feel that and interpret that sensation. You can try it with more abrasive textures as well, like working your way up to a washcloth or even sandpaper if you're very brave and adventurous. Just make sure that you have good skin integrity. If your skin is intact, it's not going to tear easily. The third category is stereognosis training. This is when you have trouble detecting what an object is by touch if you can't see it. Again, that's like putting your hand in your pocket and not being able to tell what's in your hand. So to help retrain this, there is a great exercise that you can do that requires just a bowl or a Tupperware dish, and it can be filled with beans or rice. What you would do is put a variety of different objects in that bowl or that Tupperware dish with all of the pasta or beans, and you kind of hide them in there. You then want to put your hand in and don't look at it, but move around in there and see if you can tell what you're touching. The last category under sensory re-education is thermal stimulation. If you have trouble telling the difference between hot and cold, this is for you. You can take a warm washcloth and a cold washcloth and apply alternating each to the affected area. This can also be especially helpful if you have somebody else to help with this who knows which one is hot and cold, but you don't. That way you can accurately tell them what you're feeling versus using your unaffected side and you know which is which. The second remediation treatment is called desensitization. This is used for people who are hypersensitive to different textures, whether it be soft textures or abrasive textures. So this works in a graded sense. So we are um, starting with softer textures to see what you might be able to tolerate. This would be starting with a cotton ball. Can you tolerate a cotton ball on your skin for one minute, for five minutes, for 10 minutes? Once you are able to tolerate that, then you move up to the next texture, which might be a washcloth. Still relatively soft, but a little bit more abrasive. When you're able to tolerate that texture, move on up to the next abrasive texture and then the next abrasive texture. Again, just be cautious if you have sensitive skin um, or if you have skin that easily tears if you're using those more abrasive textures. The third remediation treatment is mirror therapy. And you may have heard me talk about this before in the context of improving movement, but it's actually been shown with some promising results to help improve detection of pressure, touch, and temperature as well. If you are unfamiliar with mirror therapy and how to do it, I recommend that you check out this video where I go into much more detail and a specific protocol on how to do mirror therapy. Now, as far as exercises to improve sensation with the mirror therapy, you would get into position. So that means that your unaffected side would be facing the mirror, which means it's looking like it's your affected side. And I would have somebody else help you apply those different types of sensations um, that you are struggling with on your affected side. So for example, if you have trouble detecting light touch, 
you would have someone apply light touch to your unaffected side in the hopes that it's going to help improve that on your affected side. While you are watching in the mirror as someone is doing this, feeling those sensations. The fourth remediation treatment is electrical stimulation. This might be where you use a TENS unit to stimulate the nerves under your skin or your cutaneous nerves. You're not trying to cause a muscular contraction. We're not focused on movement, we're focused on sensation. If you get approval to try it, make sure that you're not using it by itself, but you're using it in conjunction with other types of interventions. Otherwise, it's probably not going to be as effective. All right, the fifth and last remediation treatment is exposure therapy, but hang with me here. I know that that sounds a little bit scary. This is specifically for improving your experience with social interaction. So there's not a ton of research behind this intervention for stroke survivors. There is some limited evidence for its use with people who have sensory processing disorders, as well as those who might be neurodivergent. So the person that this might be right for is if being social is a really important aspect of your life, but sensory overwhelm or overstimulation has been getting in the way of that. So this would probably be a combination of using some of those modification treatments in addition to this exposure therapy where maybe you would initially go out with your noise canceling headphones and maybe go sit in a library. Does that bother you? Can you tolerate that? Then you would grade up to maybe where you're having lunch with a friend at a quiet cafe. Then work your way up to going out to dinner with several of your family members. This would really be best worked on with a therapist, but I know not everybody has access to that. So that's why I wanted to give you a few examples and different ways that you could incorporate this into your home rehab routine. Leave me a comment and let me know if you have tried any of these sensory interventions. And of course, a huge thank you to all of the donors who make videos like these possible with a special thanks to Heather G, Ryan D, and Modus Nova in our Empower tier on Patreon. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next time.